<laughs> well, Mark, thank you very much for hosting me, and thanks to the uh, <clears throat> Institute and the uh, German Marshall Fund for bringing everybody together uh, for this very important topic. Uh, hello to Berlin. I understand this is going to be broadcast uh, in Berlin over the next 24 hours. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that <clears throat> during my tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009, I had uh, some wonderful opportunities to work with my counterpart in Germany, Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble, who's now the finance minister. And uh, his tremendous leadership and the tremendous, tremendous leadership of Germany under Chancellor Merkel uh, was very, very important in driving transatlantic cooperation uh, in the area of security in a lot of different uh, arenas. And so I'm, I'm particularly delighted to have <clears throat> this German connection uh, to some extent rekindled in the course of this conversation. Well, uh, everyone's used the term soft power and hard power, <clears throat> and someone has used the term smart power. And to give credit where it's due, I believe these terms were coined by uh, Professor Joe Nye at Harvard, who, in the interest of full disclosure, I should say, is uh, <clears throat> one of the board of advisors of my uh, consulting group. Uh, and I think he's done a good job of capturing uh, the idea that in the modern world, and maybe always, power has been a, a multidimensional uh, approach to getting what you want in the world. I mean, if we define what power is, it's about using the appropriate combination of carrots and sticks to drive behavior in a way that we want to promote. And <clears throat> the um, use of power and the effective uh, qualification of power has really been a fundamental political issue since nation states first arrived on the scene literally millennia ago. There is a lot of disagreement though about what we mean by hard and soft power. So let me give you my definition of the terms and then try to illustrate why I think perhaps now more than ever it's become very important to think very broadly about power across the entire spectrum from classic hard power into uh, what we would describe as, as perhaps very flexible soft power. <clears throat> um, hard power, I think we generally agree, means the use of coercive force to drive change, uh, whether it's military force, whether it's uh, arresting people as a law enforcement matter. We're talking about the kind of power that doesn't leave the person on the other end much choice except to go along. But soft power, I think, is a much more fluid matter. Some, some people mean by soft power uh, cultural uh, issues, uh, our art, um, our political philosophy, uh, our literature, and how these can move people and change their mind. Uh, some people mean by soft power to include economic uh, incentives, the ability to build economies, to give foreign aid, um, and to do things to enable economic development that will sometimes drive certain kinds of change. Uh, sometimes people mean by soft power people-to-people -people type of diplomacy, where we either bring people from other countries to our own country or we send people from our country overseas, whether it's as students or as business people or as Im ambassadors, uh, so-called ambassadors of exchange, the idea being that by having interpersonal relationships, we broaden understanding. And I would argue that probably soft power means all of those. Uh, it applies to any means that we use to advance our goals that are non-coercive means, whether it's aid and assistance, whether it's persuasion, <clears throat> whether it's leading by example, whether it's intriguing people and bringing them over to our point of view by simply uh, having entertaining and persuasive kinds of uh, methods of communication. I think all of these fall within the ambit of soft power. It's always been the case, I would argue, that soft power has been an important part of international diplomacy and international relations. Uh, <clears throat> the truth is there's no country, or almost no country in history, in which the leadership of the country has had such overwhelming totalitarian control over its population that the popular will has been irrelevant. Uh, even the countries that we think about as being dictatorships have always had a dimension within the country of the need to deal with popular concerns and popular expression. 
uh, because no, very few people in history have had the kind of absolute power that enables them to disregard the various constituency groups and stakeholders that operate within the country. If we look, for example, at even powers like China these days, or, or powers like Iran, where we have systems that are not, uh, I would argue, democratic systems, uh, certainly not representative systems, nevertheless, the, the leadership group still has to be attentive to the concerns of the population, whether those are economic concerns, whether those are concerns for health and safety, or whether those are concerns for culture. And so these internal dynamics still become an important part of what drives leadership decision making in even non-democratic or non-republican, uh, and I don't mean this in a partisan way, I mean in a, in a systemic way, in non-democratic or non-republican countries. 